Mm, I think this is a very competitive or a very um, appealing pitch towards people who are choosing medicine or even thinking about ophthalmology as a perspective uh, about a specialty. So I think for me, uh, the experimental aspect is very uh, interesting. And on that note, as it's time to get into why would you choose cornea external eye disease and refractive surgery as a subspecialty, as opposed to say um, glaucoma and other oculoplastic. What is the appeal of this part that attracts you towards this field? Yeah, so I, I think that when I was a when I was a trainee, um, you you know you hear a lot of you know when I was a resident and a lot of you know famous uh, people come to talk and professors mm -hmm. come and talk and you listen to things and stuff as well. Um, the um, there are times when you look at uh, things that happen in the field, yep. right, where there are really jumps. I mean, there's been a you know big revolution or there's been a big improvement in mm -hmm. something itself. Um, for for example, I mean, I, I, I enjoyed doing retina as well at the time when I was a training and it, I was really mm -hmm. tossing up between retina and basically cornea itself. The thing mm -hmm. is, is that that time back in, back in like 2000, uh, sorry, 2006, 2005, 2006, cornea was undergoing a massive amount, a massive change. Mm -hmm. And this whole concept of switching from full thickness transplantation to doing um, selective transplantation or lamella transplantation, uh, and we're just changing individual layers. Uh, uh, so th so there's the switch to basically doing lamella mm -hmm was was coming around it's uh, at that time period and i saw and i remember um hearing a lecture um mm -hmm. in 2000 um and at that time if you look at the outcomes of corner transplantation over a 25 year period mm -hmm. or 30 year period actually the results are the same there's no difference right and now you can say well why is that and and so you think that we have better microscopes we have better instruments maybe um, so you surely expect the result to be better itself. But when you look at survival curves, they're exactly the same. Mm -hmm. Biggest revolution was switching the surgery and the way we performed the surgery. And this had a dramatic effect on basically outcomes for patients. So I saw that back in 2000. And so I, in 2000, I thought, well, this is interesting. And I realized in 2003, 2004, I have to learn this surgery to be able to do this well, because mm -hmm. it's going to change the whole field and stuff. So yeah. I kind of like took the crest of the wave and there weren't that many people doing these kind of procedures back at that time now okay mm -hmm. and so i took the crest of the wave of learning something new yeah that had several fold effect because i was able to then introduce that straight away when i started practicing i learned as a, i learned it as a fellow so obviously then trying to be able to then do this as a consultant i was able to then leapfrog many people who were much older than me because they mm -hmm. couldn't do the surgery and stuff so i was able to basically learn that and, and in cornea now obviously you know, as you saw, 85% of my surgeries are not penetrating keratoplasty and stuff. So lamella yeah. surgery really dominated what we basically do nowadays. And, you know, it's like, what, 20, 15, 20 years basically later and stuff. In refractive, there was also a change. The biggest, one of the biggest changes in refractive surgery was the introduction of the excimer laser back yeah. in the 80s and 90s and stuff, right? And that changed from the old RK incision where you make those cuts on the cornea and stuff to introducing a much more controlled outcome. The other big change that basically happened was, again, early 2004, 2005, with the introduction of femtosecond lasers. Mm -hmm. Okay, And we I, and again, I had the opportunity then at that time, 2007, 2008, to use one of the first commercial lasers, which were very, very new at that time. And also then to understand and understand how these things basically work. So that's the sort of inquisitive part of mm -hmm. understanding. It's not just saying hey, I buy a laser, this is what the company tell me it can basically do. It's understanding, going back to understanding some basic principles. And, and you saw that with the lab that we have here, yeah. where we do a lot of animal work and wound healing work and understanding from a basic mechanism of how a principal thing will work itself. And then, of course, as those things have become much more commercial now, of course, a lot of the publications that we published back in those days, back in 2009, 2010, have now been cited many, many times because they were really established some under basic understanding of how these principles basically work. So when people fast forward it now down to 2023 and stuff, mm -hmm. they, they ask, how come you, you know, you guys know so much about this, but you know, we, we've been working in this area for almost 14 years and stuff and things, mm -hmm. right. When things were very infant and stuff. So you have a very good idea. So I, I almost, I, I look at it as almost catching the crest of the wave or at the beginning mm -hmm. of the wave of two technologies that now have become so mainstream mm -hmm. that, 
people just take these things for granted now that this is how it's done. And mm. I was like, yeah, yeah, but it's not, it wasn't done like this <laughs> fast, right? We yeah. work out how to work out how to do these things and stuff as well. So that's been the exciting thing from there itself. And I think that really testament to the fact of how ophthalmology keeps on improving and, and the outcomes that we have now in 2023 for a lot of our surgery, for our transplants, mm. um, even for our refractive surgery, are unbelievable even sort of like 10 or 15 years ago you would never have thought you know i saw i was just came clinic this morning and, and i saw patients in my clinic this morning who've had transplant son who's seen 66 vision right mm -hmm. which is just um you would I just think it's unbelievable right yeah. with just with a pair of specs with a low myopic correction and stuff or maybe a small amount of astigmatism that's it and yeah. you would i mean even 15 years ago you just think this is unbelievable to achieve this mm -hmm. outcome consistently but that's that's within our goal now and, I, and actually, I can tell you, I think it's even going to get even better than this. And I mean, you, I can see the next five years, what's going to come into the future and stuff in that time period. And I think things will get even better. Hmm. So when you talk about a lot of innovative technology back in the day, from DMAC to femtosecond laser, you're sort of shifting the paradigm of treatment. But then you, in a, in a certain way, you're also challenging the status quo of how to produce, how to do a cataract surgery, how to do a refractive surgery. So you may have met with a lot of criticism. So how do you sort of convince them that, oh, this is the new way and there's a better way to do it a certain way? 